Uh, amen, family. Now, my uh, on, my title and one point for my short little charge is discipline and repentance. Come on. Now, it's it's so great to have discipline in your life. Like, for example, having the discipline to uh, to go work out, you know, get all big and strong, you know, or to have the discipline to uh, clean your room once a week. I know I need that discipline. Uh, but what's even greater than these, although still important, family, is to have the discipline of repentance. Let's go to Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. Let's go to Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. And it says here, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. It's a great scripture. Yeah. <clears throat> now, family, we, uh, we, did, we live in a world full of darkness. Mm-hmm. I mean, God did cast down Satan onto earth. Yeah, come on, man. And not only that, but we always have a cloud of eyes judging our every movement of seeing if we do something wrong as disciples from the yeah. world. And because of this, we need to throw things uh, that cause us to stumble away yeah, yeah. and turn away from the sin that gets us tangled up. Yeah. And when we turn away, we absolutely must run to our true source of power, Come on, bro. our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, yeah. to continue this great race with perseverance. Yeah. Come on, bro. It was Jesus who pioneered and perfected faith, yeah. the Son of God, no one else. It wasn't David, it wasn't Elijah, it wasn't Moses. Wow. It was Jesus Christ, yeah. the true the true and only Son of God. Yeah. Wow. Jesus endured so much when he was alive. He was spat on. Come on man. He was criticized, beaten, yeah. flogged, and even died a criminal's death on the cross. Yeah. And yet, he went through it all. Because he was focused on finishing his great task of opening a new lifeline to God through him. And also sitting at God's right hand on, of his throne when he died and went to heaven. And with this family, we should be encouraged from this great endearment. Because when we focus on Jesus and all that he has done for us, we will not grow weary and lose heart. But be energetic and heart-filled in God. <clears throat> now, I understand that none of us are perfect like Jesus is. I know I'm definitely not perfect. I have my own flaws. But, <laughs> and, and the, the fact of the matter is, is we will eventually mess up. After all, it is in our flesh to do so. But the point I'm trying to make here, family, is that we need to constantly fight through the spiritual battle and endure so that we can have the likeness of Jesus. See, we can't be like, we can't be Jesus, but we can be like him. Now, let's say you do mess up. Well, what then? uh, let's, Let's look at a man who endured and fell, fell down but got back up and changed the whole game of running. This man had a tough childhood growing up. He grew up in poverty and often had to go without basic necessities in rural Jamaica. And when he was of age, he trained tirelessly, ate a strict diet, and made other great sacrifices to achieve his goal of becoming a great Olympic sprinter. Wow. And on August 16th, 2008, 
He won three gold medal, wow. Olympic medals, and became the fastest man alive. This man's name was Usain Bolt. Wow. Now, do you think Usain Bolt said quits when he messed up in training or he just he felt like he wasn't running the fastest? Amen. Of course not. He got back up and persevered through his rigorous training to achieve his goal. Yeah. Family, this man did this so he could achieve the victory of having a physical gold medal. How much more greater is it for us that we get to get back up on our feet and persevere the great race for God? To be able to achieve the greatest medal of all, which is... Living with our one and only Heavenly Father, our great Abba God, up in heaven when we die. So family, the next time we stumble in sin, we need to just get back up. And we need to run straight to God. And to also have the best encouragement sown into our hearts, which is Jesus loves us and forgives us. Come on. My simple challenge is for us all, family, is to study out what repentance is. There are a ton of great scriptures on what repentance really is. And I encourage you all to look at them. Uh, to also pray to God for forgiveness and strength. Yeah. It is, it's so, and not only that, but to also be open to your disciples yeah. and also other disciples, brothers with brothers and yeah. sisters with sisters, yeah, so that we can have just that extra uh, spiritual healing yeah. Yeah. aspect. Yeah. Bro, bro. And to also have a plan of what your repentance will look like for whatever it is we need to repent on. Yeah. With that, family, to God be all the glory. Amen. Amen. Come on. Good evening, family. Are we fired up to get into the Word? It's incredible as all of our lessons here this, this, this evening are about discipline. And you see, there's some terms I just kind of want to break down so I can just help you guys understand. Uh, both are super important, but I believe one is above the other. Uh, you see, there's one definition called motivation. Right, write this down if you want. Motivation is the desire to do something. Right, you're motivated to go to the gym, you're motivated to do something. You're motivated. The next one is discipline. Discipline is the act of doing something, even if you don't feel like it. That's discipline. Right, discipline is going to the gym when you don't feel like going to the gym. Right, discipline is choosing to do something, even though you don't feel like doing it, right? It, 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 it's going against what the heart desires and what the flesh desires there. And a key point that I want to focus on in my lesson is quiet times. So my point is discipline in quiet times. Let's turn here to Mark 1. Let's turn to Mark 1. Mark 1, and you guys can probably assume where we're going here when it comes to quiet times in Mark 1. But uh, Mark 1, what we're going to actually do is we're going to read some, um, some paraclopies. Paraclopies are essentially uh, the subheadings um, right above the titles of all the different passages. Um, so in verse 9, right, right above it, it says, The baptism and testing of Jesus. So we see Jesus, right after being baptized, he's tested. We all can relate to that. Right, right after getting baptized, right out of the waters, he's being tested. Right, uh, and in and, and, and verse 16, right, that subheading says, Jesus calls his first disciples. So after Jesus is tested, after he, after he gets baptized, now he's going out and making disciples. Right, we, we all can relate to that as well. Verse 21, right, the subheading for that one says that Jesus drives out in pure spirit. So Jesus is now like driving out demonic spirits. Yeah. Verse 29 says, Jesus heals many. Right? So it's definitely a lot that Jesus has on his plate here. This is all in, in, in one session. This is all in one place. This is all taking place in, in, in one basically singular day. That is back to back to back. He makes his disciples. He drives out a spirit and he's healing many people. He's staying up late at night. 
And it's the same for us. When we face trials and hardships and we have things going on back to back to back and we're so exhausted and we're so worn out. Yet, let's take a look at Jesus' discipline in this aspect. Verse 35, verse 35 to verse 38. says here, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you! Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach to there also. Uh, this is why I've come. So he traveled through Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. So we see that very early in the morning, Jesus, right, he, he, he got up, he went to spend time with his father. That even though he might have not felt like getting up, Amen. he just had a busy day yesterday, and he probably didn't feel like getting up very early in the morning, yet he was still disciplined enough to do so. Why? Why was he willing to do it? Well, because he wanted to spend time with his father, with Abba. And I want, I want, to just ask, I want you guys to ask yourselves this. Write this down. Where are you guys spending time? Great question. When you first wake up in the morning... Where are you spending time? Is it is it on social media? Do you do you do you click on the Instagram, the Facebook, scroll for a bit before you jump into your quiet time? Right? Is it is it is it checking out on a video game before you jump into your quiet time? You know, get a quick brown in, you know, I want to warm up my brain, right? Where is it? Right? Ask yourself and challenge yourself. Right? This week, family, one day out of this week, I want you guys to get up before it sun is in the morning. So, right, get up early in the morning. So the sun rises at 7 here in Lincoln, Nebraska. So you have to get up at around 6. Get up at around 7 on the dot if you want, right? Yeah. So that's my challenge for you. Finally, let's close out in 2 Timothy 1 here. Let's close out here, 2 Timothy 1. I wish I could get deeper into this, this topic here, but... I'm time sensitive. Second Timothy 1, verse 7 to 8 says here. Says, for page turn. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join me in the suffering. For the gospel, by the power of God, he has saved us and called us to a holy life. Amen. We see, family, that when we choose, when we chose back in, the, back in the world, we chose to study God's word and we chose to do quiet times on a daily basis, that this scripture would now apply to us. Right. That family, we now have the spirit of God dwelling inside of us that helps us to no longer just be motivated to do quiet Come times, on, but to now be self-disciplined yeah. to do quiet times. That spirit, right, it, it guides us to deny ourselves. Yeah. It guides us to deny ourselves every single day to Come get on, into the scriptures, God. right? A disciple's self-discipline in quiet times is what sets them apart from the world. Come on, yeah. bro. That is what sets us apart from the world, is our self-discipline to get into God's right, word. Right. So my challenge, family, is study out characteristics in your quiet time. Come up with a plan, study out some characteristics. Study out what it means to be powerful. Study out what it means to have love. Study out what it means to have self-discipline. Right? Tonight, family, we have the same spirit Jesus had. That he would uh, face his testing, that he would call disciples, that he would remove the impure spirits, that he would heal many, and that he would have the discipline to have his quiet time. Family, let's go after this in a powerful way. To God be all the glory. Oh, oh, good evening, family. Uh, the title I've been given uh, for this part of discipline is Discipline in Spiritual Maturity. Amen. Oh, Turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. I have a scripture I'd love to share with you all. Share, bro. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. Here it says, like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it 
you may grow up in your salvation. Amen? Amen. It's interesting, right? Here, Peter the Apostle, he calls for you and I to crave pure spiritual milk. Okay, that sounds great. But what, is, what, is this, what does he mean by this? What does he mean? Like cow milk? Like maybe chocolate milk, brothers, chocolate milk, uh, so strawberry milk, right, right, right. No, right. When, when, when my family, when uh, if you're a baptized disciple, right, you came out of the waters of baptism, and the Bible says that you were born to a new life in Romans six four, right. So spiritually, you were an infant, right. Therefore, if you want to grow up spiritually, crave this spiritual nourishment that is this milk. But 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 what what, what, what really is it though? It's not very clear. Let's let's turn our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5. Well, we get a little deeper understanding in the scriptures there as to what Peter might mean. Hebrews chapter 5. Are we, are we here? Are we fired up? Yeah. 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 I'm excited to share about spiritual milk, man. Uh, Hebrews, let's go to Hebrews here. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. Here it says, We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Wow, so, okay, so here, so the Bible talks about spiritual milk again here. And the Holy Spirit, through the Hebrew author, says that to the disciples, in fact, by this time, you ought to be teachers. Mm. This, by this time, you ought to be Bible talk leaders. There by this you time, you, you ought to be able to lead Bible studies. By this time, you ought to be discipling someone. But he says you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. So it's like you need milk, not solid food. So for you and I... The spiritual milk Peter refers to is the same foundational teaching the Hebrew author is talking about here. Yeah. Emphasizing the basic elementary truths, the first principles of Christianity that every disciple must understand, know, and grow from. So you and I should have a great discipline and a craving to know the first principles. Bible studies, amen? My, my family, you and I, we know the secrets of the will of God. We know the very secrets of God's will. Through the scriptures, the Bible of how someone can seek after God to be a true worshiper in the eyes of him. That man worships in spirit and in truth. That in the word of God study, the Bible is the standard for our lives. It's always relevant. It's always applicable. That disciples for you and I, we know this. Like we should know this like a back of our hands, right? As disciples, disciples make disciples. They deny themselves and carry the cross daily and have a vision to get to all the ends of the nations. Amen. Go making disciples, right? Light in darkness, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sin, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Guys, the disciples in the first century, they didn't question these things. They knew these things like the back of their hand. This was their bread and butter, right? These were actually the spiritual milk. These were the basics to them. So could you imagine, like, for us as, as uh, disciples, spiritually, like, you, maybe you as a father, imagine you as a father, a mother, and you have a kid, you're raising them, and they're, feed, they're feeding off milk for some time, and maybe they're two years old, milk, okay, that's fine, three years old, four years old, five years old, still drinking milk. No, 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 man, 10 years old, whoa! you got to be a, a parent that sees this and throws the red flags and goes, man, my, my, my son, my daughter, is there's something off. There's something wrong because they're not moving on to solid food. My family, once you get down the basics that is the first principles, the scriptures, the spiritual milk, you'll be able to move on to further and deeper teachers into God's word for his glory. Amen. So my challenge for you in the next three months, that's like uh, uh, up until September right there, have a discipline to study out the first principles. Mm -hmm. To be able to confidently lead. If you're not seeking God, lead seeking God powerfully. Know it like the back of your hand. Uh, seeking God, if not, okay, word of God. You got it down? Okay, word of God. The next one's kingdom. The next one there, like, right? You move on to whatever the need is, is right? Man, uh, for me personally, I'm preaching to myself here. You know, by this time, you know, I ought to be able to lead these Bible studies. And man, I'm so eager to go after this challenge. And I pray that you guys are eager to join in with me as well. Amen. So, let's learn how to wield this sword. Amen. 
Let's go after making him known, giving him the glory by knowing the basics, the spiritual milk, and let's have a great discipline so that by six months on, six months forward, by the end of the year, we'll get as many people to be able to lead through the first principles. And we'll see so many more fruit and people enter God's kingdom. Amen. So with that, to God be all the glory. Amen. Let's go, Let's go, bro. Amen. 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 I hope you guys are still fired up to hear the word of God. Amen. Amen. All right, if you will, please turn your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 4. And uh, the title of my little sermonette is Discipline in Prayer. Now, as you guys know, prayer is one of those things, is, it's a necessity on a daily basis. And not just in the morning with your quiet time, but all throughout the day. Whenever you need to say something, just say it to God. Just say a prayer. But as you guys know, some of us can pray for, you know, God, give me strength. Yeah. And therefore, he gives us an opportunity to be strong. Or we can pay, uh, pray for patience, and then there's an opportunity to be patient with something that's kind of making us lose our uh, uh, patience. Amen. But in First uh, Peter chapter 4, verse 7, the Bible says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. So right here, we know that uh, this is a chapter that talks about living for God. Yes. And right at the beginning of uh, verse 7, it says, the end of all things is near. What do you think that means? Literally, the end of all things is near, guys. Yeah. And it says, therefore, so it's giving you something to go by, right? Something to actually do, something to act. And it says, to be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Now, it's kind of crazy because to be alert, it's almost like when your phone's going off and you know that the ringtone's gone or you hear the vibration on the table. And in that same way, we have to be alert when it comes to sin, when it comes to trials of many kinds, when it comes to really any circumstance or any kind of obstacle before us, because then we're able to pray about these things. We're able to approach these things in a way where we have that sober mind. Uh, as you guys know, in the world, many of us have uh, consumed alcohol. And so we all know that when we consume alcohol up to a certain limit, we can't really drive. Our judgment is skewed and our skills and how we, you know, uh, uh, use the steering wheel. It's out, totally out the window. And it's the same thing when it comes to us praying. So if you've had a hard time praying as a recent, maybe you're just not alert or of sober mind. It can be a distraction of faithlessness. It can be a distraction really of, of anything, uh, uh, something that, you know, stunts you at, at work that got you very angry. Any kind of sin, it's going to cause you to not have a sober mind. But if you will, please turn to uh, Luke chapter 6. As we get to see, you know, an example, uh, something that really, really convicted me when it came to my prayer life. But Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter six, and uh, verse twenty-eight. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. It says, "Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you." Wow. You know, one of those things that uh, would not allow me to have a sober mind was when people would mistreat me, both of the world or even in the kingdom. Yeah. And maybe it wasn't them mistreating me, but I thought they were mistreating me. But what is, what is the, the message here? To pray for those who mistreat you. And it's crazy because that's one thing that we can, be, uh, can be very difficult for us to do. Because say if somebody comes up and smacks you in the face, what does the Bible say to do? To pray for that person. Turn the other cheek, actually, yeah. You guys know the context, but, but it says to pray for that person. Pray for somebody that's mistreating you. You know, prayer is not just for that morning quiet time, but all throughout the time of day. So again, don't just leave prayer in your quiet time. But take God with you. Uh, yeah. Walk with the Lord as you're talking to him. There's been some times where I'm on the bus, guys, and I'm like, man, I didn't pray enough, so let me pray. I put my headphones on so I don't look as crazy, amen. And I'm in there just like people think I'm having a conversation, but I'm, I'm actually just talking to God. I'm actually, and it's crazy because if you guys have rid, uh, ridden the, the bus here in Lincoln, like there's some sketchy people on the buses, guys. Amen. Sometimes I get mad, dog, but I'm like, man, I'm just praying to God. Like I, I have nothing to do with these people. But again, those who mistreat you, you pray for them. Yeah. If you will, please turn to Philippians chapter 4 as we have another scripture. And this is a scripture that we hear actually pretty often. But Philippians chapter 4, if I can get there. God eats popcorn. <laughs> Philippians chapter 4, picking up in verse 4, it says, Rejoice always, or sorry, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So right, now, right here we see that we have to rejoice always, right? Rejoice yeah. in the Lord always. And with what I've been hearing about, you know, the good news sharing and stuff that's going around the church, we know that, you know, there's been many times where we've had to rejoice and maybe we haven't. But the Bible says it clearly right here to rejoice. 
He says again, to rejoice and to allow your gentleness to be evident to all. Why? Because the Lord is near. And we can be anxious about these things, but what does it say? He says, to present your request to God with what? By prayer and petition, but with thanksgiving. So if you're missing a little bit of thanksgiving, then I don't know if your heart's right when, when you're saying that prayer. Because I know there was a lot of times where I'd present my request to God and I had false motives. Uh, it's also talked about in James 1, how people can have wrong motives and their prayers may not be uh, answered because why? Well, you're going to use that thing to, to not really be fruitful about it. You're not, you know, you're not really going to uh, uh, allow God to be glorified through it. So when it comes to creating a disciplined prayer life, it takes one, much practice and much effort. Yeah. So when it comes to that practice, I want to ask a question. Where is your prayer life right now? Are you praying every single morning? Are you praying every single time you have an opportunity uh, uh, to be patient, to be loving, to be kind, to allow that, that uh, love to be evident to all? Or are you just being flat out sinful or just not caring? Are you being apathetic? Because, again, there is much opportunity to grow in this discipline simply by just praying through every single uh, moment of every single day. Literally. Think about where you're at. Be alert of where you're at. Be sober of where you're at in your life and what you're saying, how you're conducting yourself around your coworkers, around the disciples. And just pray through these things, literally. If you have a hard time praying as well, guess what? One thing that I was able to do when practicing prayer, I would just go and ask somebody, hey, what's one prayer request that I can uh, pray for? And then to the next person, hey, what's one prayer request I can have? And then I would do that on Instagram. I'd go up and text everybody individually. Now I'd have a list of about 30 minutes of prayer. And again, this over time allowed that discipline to come into place because it took much practice and much effort. But with that, guys, I really do hope that you guys consider your prayer life uh, 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 as less of, of where you should be because, again, we can always be growing. We can always be talking to God our Father. He, he's literally just waiting for us to, to talk to Him. It's just a matter of us doing it. But with that, to God be all the glory. Come on, yeah. 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 Discipline in the secular. Wow. Let's go ahead and talk, open our Bible over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to look at verse 8. It says, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has things, has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Awesome, right? So yeah. Paul writes to Timothy on various aspects of ministry and godly living. Yeah. And what he's saying here is that he acknowledges basically physical training has some value, right? Yeah. You know, for myself, I've been trying to get back into the gym lately. And I know a couple of brothers as well, you know, Alex for joining me, you know, trying to get you know, back in shape, right? And it's interesting that Paul even writes this because understanding that, that physical training has value, right? Because it's likely that he already would have been in shape, right? You know, in the first century, walking was the primary mode of transportation. You know, food scarcity and, and absence of like the processed food we all have today meant that overeating was very uncommon. Paul himself, he was a tent maker by trade, which would require tremendous amounts of, of strength and endurance, physical endurance. And in fact, most jobs during this time would have been physically demanding. You know? His various missionary journeys, which involved very long distances, for example, Philippi to Thessalonica, yeah. is actually a 100 mile like, walk right there. And so likely Paul would have already been in shape. He, he, would have, he would have been looking like Leo, right? He, was, he, he would have already been in shape, right? But he said still that physical training has some value, right? And today I want to talk about different growth opportunities we can have in ourselves, which retain some value, right? We're going to look at Mark chapter 1, and uh, Deshaun almost stole this, but we're going to look at Mark chapter 1, verse 17. It says, come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Awesome. Jesus here, he leads by example. He calls out to his disciples to come and follow him, and he's calling them to imitate his example. In the same way for ourselves, have you thought to consider what sort of example is it that you are setting? What sort of first impression do you give off? You know, there's a saying, don't judge a book by its cover. But I dare say that the reason that the book has a cover is because the cover is meant to be judged. So you do, in fact, judge a book by its cover. Family, how does your cover look this morning? You know, a bad first impression can be the reason why someone decides to study the Bible with you or maybe not study the Bible with you, right? You know, your appearance 
Um, sorry, it's a, consider this. In the very first study, seeking God, right? Yeah. You know, you're ultimately calling the other person to imitate your example, to imitate your discipline. Yeah. To wake up early in the morning, 6 a.m., 5 a.m., like Sean said, and have quiet times each and every single day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. However, your own appearance is an outward reflection of your own discipline. Whoa. Your appearance alone can prove whether or not you practice what you preach. Come on. Look at Titus chapter 2. Bro, let's go ahead. Again. Titus chapter 2. We're going to look at verse 6 to 10. Verse 6, it says, Similarly, encourage the young men to be self controlled in everything. Set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, sow integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not talk back to them, and not to steal from them but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about our God and Savior attractive, right? Wow. So Paul is writing a letter here to Titus explaining that when others are able to see positive changes in your life and positive virtues in your life, it's going to actually attract them to the message of, of Christ, right? Wow. right? You know, and for yourselves, when you're in Bible studies, like, are you sitting there Snacking on McDonald's and chips. Are you are you are you underweight? Are you overweight? Are you well groomed? Are you dressing to impress? Are you dressed in a dirty t-shirt and flip-flops? Are you making the gospel attractive, right? Now I want to show you guys a picture here. And some of you might have seen this before, but if not, I'll explain it, right? This picture right here is called survivorship bias. And the idea is that um, pretty much during World War II. The military had wanted to reinforce their planes based on where they were being hit. They examined the returning aircraft and they put the red dots where they thought well, all the bullet holes were at in the plane, right? Okay. And so what they thought was to add armor to these areas where the red dots are. And so they wanted to increase the plane's chances of survival, right? Okay. right, right. Now, however, a statistician named Abraham Wall pointed out a crucial insight. The bullet holes on the returning planes indicated the areas where they could sustain damage and still make it back. Therefore, the areas without bullet holes, those are actually the areas where the most critical damage takes place, yeah. leading to the plane actually not returning in the first place. Wow. Right? Wow. Walt recommended reinforcing the areas with the least damage on the returning planes, as those were the planes that, when hit, led to the aircraft being lost. This is an example of survivorship bias, right? Wow. Now, good. in the good. same way for us, right, the military, they wanted to go after, you know, what was obvious, what was, what was easily seen at first, yeah. which was the bullet holes. They thought, they thought, hey, where the bullet holes are located, let's put the most armor there, right? Mm -hmm. Now, it, they, they, they did that because in their mind it was obvious, right? In the same way, I think for ourselves, we're, we're very quick to as well focus on what is obvious, right? Wow. And in doing so, we almost miss the big picture entirely. Oh, you know, we can find ourselves being so focused on the bullet holes of uh, perseverance, Ooh. bullet holes of purity, bullet, bullet holes of accountability and, yeah. and, and character in all these different areas, right? And we're, we're so easy to, to overshadow what is not so obvious, what is not so easily seen, right? Wow. You know, Proverbs 15, 22 says, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Right. Wow. My challenge is for you to ask those who are closest to you in your life, what areas do you think I can work on and improve right. in my character? Exactly. Exactly. To be honest, it can be hard at times to acknowledge you have a problem unless it's pointed out to you by somebody else. Yeah. Yeah, those closest to you are going to be able to help you quickly identify those areas. Perhaps someone tells that you have an a habit of eating out too much. Maybe you're unwise with your spending. Maybe the words you say lack emotional intelligence. Maybe you're bad at time management and you're always late to meetings. Maybe you would benefit from the calendar. Maybe you're in a household and what's considered clean to you is dirty to somebody else. Right? You need to ask around and plan out these areas which are not so obvious and work on to improve them. Family, that being said, let us push forward and improve in our discipline and doing so will make the gospel more attractive and continue to bring many lost souls into God's glorious kingdom. Amen. Yeah.